Hey, and welcome back to the Harry Man Show, episode 64. We have an incredible metal drummer and thrash drummer, Greg Hall, on today. He's formerly of Sacred Right, and he's been playing his whole life. This is a, a drummer you definitely have to check out, and also a Phoenix native as well. So I've, I've, you know, I've heard from other drummers to check him out and reach out to him, and he's on the show with us today. How are you doing, Greg? Good. How are you, man? Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem, man. I uh, I really appreciate it. I, like, uh, like I, I've been geeking out on your videos for the last couple of days, and yeah, you, you got some, <laughs> right you, you got some amazing chops, there, man. Ah, thank you. Yeah, it's been almost four years since I've actually played, so. Oh wow. Hopefully, it's uh, still muscle memory still there. I think it's more of a stamina issue for me at this point. Uh huh. You know, I I need to start hiking and getting my uh, cardio up. Yeah. But uh, I think the skill level, you know. I don't think that ever really goes away until no, that's you're r- really old. And, <laughs> <laughs> no, <that's> <laughs> and you, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I, when you can't wipe your own butt, then you can't play the drums either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so I think you still got quite a few years for then, but uh, yeah, that wisdom is never going to leave you uh, that, all that knowledge. But uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's take it back. To, uh, how did it all start for you? What, what about what age did you start playing? I started when I was probably around 12. Um, I had two older, I have two older sisters and both of them dated musicians. And so there seems like there was always a band in and out of the house. And um, I just gravitated to the drums. And so, you know, I just, I liked playing. And then of course, when I was about 14 or 15, I discovered Rush and then, Oh, there you go. It was like it was it was over from there. <laughs> awesome. I'm like, holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> That's badass. <laughs> you know, some some people, you know, grew up listening to Kiss and things like that. And I really wasn't in. Well, once I found Rush, it was just I had blinders on, which is not a bad, you know, not a bad uh, no. band to go down that road with. But uh, jumping into, you know, I really, I didn't. I didn't listen to much of anything else once I discovered them. I was so immersed in, in Rush that... What was the first album that pulled you in? Um, you know, and it's funny because I remember Kelly Smith from Flotsam and Jetsam. He's a little older than me, probably a year. And I had run into him at somewhere at high school or something, and he's like, oh, I'm going to see Rush. And I think he was going to Permanent Waves. Okay. And I was like, man, I wish I could go. I was just too young. I didn't, I don't know. But the, the first Rush concert I ever saw was Moving Pictures. Oh. And then I proceeded to see them every time. I've probably seen Rush, I don't know, 20 times, which in the grand scheme of Rush fans is pretty low. But, yeah, I didn't <laughs> miss them for years and years. There's some people that have seen them hundreds of times, you know. Yeah. But, um, and so, yeah, it was it was really Kelly kind of turned me on. My older sister, she had a, which you know, I still have this to this day. She had a Hemispheres picture disc. Oh wow! And I was I was always in trouble. I'm like, what is that? You know? <laughs> She's like, that's Rush. And she was into like Yes and King Crimson and all this, you know, prog stuff. And it's good taste. And, and that's kind of probably where I picked up on that. Just kind of turned that corner towards that rather than you know, like I said, like Kiss or some other band, it would have been just as easily for me to get into something like that. But once I discovered, like I said, it was just so challenging and it just pushed me to, I was like, I got to do that. (laughs) And so, you know, you try and fail and and then that's how you get better. But um, now learning all that, did it just make everything else easier once you got the hang of it? Was it just kind of like everything was just kind of a a downgrade at that point? (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, having, having Neil as a, a de facto teacher yeah. <laughs> for all those years, you know, you kind of learn just t- tastiness, you know what I mean? Like he was, he was just such a tasty drummer and there were so many nuances going on with, with his playing that, um, it, you know, you could listen to it a number of times and always hear something different or just hear how he progressed through the song with, you know, the first drum fill might be pretty simple and then then it'll come back around and he'll do something even more. And then like the last one, he's like full on, like, you know, it was very, always build. He would always build on the suspense of his drumming. And it was, it was great, you know, very unpredictable at the same time as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as you, since you had a kit in the house, were your parents supportive? Did they buy you your first kit? If you can remember that? 
Uh, well, you know, again, one of my sister's boyfriends uh-huh. was a drummer and he had this big, huge double bass pearl kit and, and he left it over here for a while. And so I'd play it and then he ended up wanting to sell it. And he only wanted like 300 bucks for it. And I went to my dad and I'm like, Hey, you know, he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom wanted to do it, but my dad was like, no. And finally my d- dad and mom got divorced when I was probably around 12 or so. Mm-hmm. And so finally, once he was out of the house, my mom would allow me to have drums in the house. And oh, so that's I had this, mom. and my mom very much supported me like every, you know, every birthday, Christmas, every fucking Arbor day, she would get me a cymbal or sticks or a stand or, you know, so she really helped facilitate what I was doing. That's a good mom. Um, now my older sisters hated it and they, you know, would drive them crazy. Of course, you know, I get it. <laughs> Drums are loud. You know, I have the same dynamic now with my kids in the house. And my son's an amazing drummer, but he doesn't get a whole lot of opportunity to play because, you know, he has a sister that's in the other room. That's like, that's driving me crazy. Oh, so wow. <laughs> yeah. well, we have to wait for her to be at work, you know, so we can play. But my sisters hated it, but my mom always encouraged it. And, um, so I started off with like a little CB 700 kit and it was like literally like a three or four piece bass drum, snare drum, mm-hmm. one floor tom, one tom. <laughs> and then I built on it, you know, like I said, my mom, and I got like concert toms, and I added extra rack toms and, you know, it turned into a pretty cool kit. And then that took me from when I was probably 12 to when I was around 18 i bought my first gretch kit oh nice and uh and i worked at a car wash and and i saved all my money and there was a drum shop here in town called creative drum shop and they i would hang out there we pretty much lived in this place so they knew me really well and they let me do like a layaway thing. So I, but they wouldn't even order the drums until I paid for half of them. And oh. like, even back then this scratch kit was like five grand or something just for the show. That's like 10 grand now. Easily. Cause it's like a, you know, it was a USA custom, Yeah, you know, it was like the top of the line Gretsch, but, and uh, it's the funny story is I, I wanted Tom a drums because that's what Neil played at the time. And I was, like I said, I was so into rush. I'm like, well, I have, of course I have to have what he plays. Mm-hmm. And so I walk in the drum shop to buy these drums and the guy behind the counter, you know, a friend of mine, and he's like, he goes, okay, uh, he goes, I'll order this for you, but why do you want Tama? And I said, well, you know, of course, because the greatest drummer in the world plays Tama. And he's like, fine, but I want to show you something. So he went in the back and he got a Gretsch Tom and a Tama Tom, same size, same everything, same head. And he, he tuned them and then he come, brings them out and he goes, okay, hit the Tama. And I hit it and it sounded good. And I'm like, okay, so what's the, and then he goes, hit the Gretsch. And it was no comparison huh. at, at all. Like, I hit that Gretsch drum and I was like, oh, fuck, this is going to cost me an extra thousand bucks, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, I said, order the Gretsch. Nice. And he's like, dude, I'm telling you, you won't, you won't fucking regret it. And I never have. And every studio I show up at, the, the, the engineers are like, oh man, this is going to be fun, you know, because it's just the best. Uh, most re- high end recording studios, you know, have a Gretsch kit. Like Lars tracks on Gretsch. A lot of drummers track on Gretsch. I have to say, but they it, haven't. It's one yeah, of the most underrated uh, companies, though. You know, DW yeah. obviously owns them now, but Gretsch have really kind of been the staple of live and you know just charlie watts plays them as well too for a reason yeah well and as you know i mean they don't give anything to anyone really so yeah but for years i would always hit them up because I, I wasn't interested in changing you know i mean i could have moved to tomo or yamaha or probably a number of what and in my prime i probably could have had my pick of whatever i wanted but mm-hmm. that you know i i played them because i love them and so I would write him letters periodically and be like, you know, Hey, what do I got to do? You know, <laughs> what, what the fuck do I got to do to get some attention? You know, I get it. I'm not still calling. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. And so finally my friend, Chris Canella, who is now in Deicide, Oh, nice. And he's a Dean guitar rep, but uh, he was working for ESP guitars at the time. And 
He's like, do you have a Gretsch endorsement? And I'm like, fuck no. I go, they won't even <laughs> fucking call me back. Are you kidding me? You know? And I go, I get it. I understand. But and at the same time, I didn't want anything free. I never do. I don't. Yeah, I, I just I would like to be artist direct to the right to the guy that can get it for me. I'll pay for it, but you know, it's just so he's like, let me see what I can do, you know. And I'm like, shit, yeah, good luck. I'm not, I swear to God, two days later, I got an email, and I and it's like, hey, this is Kim Graham from. She's not there anymore, but she was the A and R person. And she's like, oh, I've heard such good things about you, and we want to offer you. A, uh, an artist deal and, and, and I'm like, I call my friend Chris. I go, what the hell did you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, I just told him that, you know, you pretty much single handedly changed the drum sound of, you know, of, of metal drums. Like when you recorded with Gretsch, like it just, it, it sounds amazing. You know? and, and so they gave me a deal. I couldn't believe it. I got a fucking Gretsch deal. Nice. So I got like 70% off or something. Oh wow! And I ordered, I ordered a new huge kit and, and uh, so I had to take advantage of that, and it's probably the last kit I'll ever get. But nice. And uh, I have the Gretsch G, just the G from the Gretsch logo tattooed on my hand. Yeah, I saw that. That's pretty cool. And I, yeah, and well, so that my friend Chris that got me the endorsement, he saw my tattoo and he uh, sent a picture of it to to Gretsch, and then he's like, he calls me, he goes send me some more of those pictures. He goes, they're, they're Fred Gretsch, the fucking owner of Gretsch. They're in a meeting and they all want to see your, your tattoo. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me right now? He's like, no, I need this. I need it right now. <laughs> so I sent him a bunch more pictures and they're all probably sitting around going, man, this guy's crazy for doing that. To this <laughs> Who would do that? But yeah, you know, that's pretty like, cool. I'm just, I'm just loyal, you know? So, yeah. and I appreciated it so much that they did that. You know, they're like, I couldn't believe it when they got back to me. I'm like, man, you must have told them some crazy shit because that lady said an about <laughs> face like nothing, man. She's like, <laughs> she went from not knowing who I was to saying all kinds of good stuff about me. <laughs> yeah. So when you got when you're around 18, when you got your first Gretsch kit, were you playing in bands at the time, or were they metal bands, or were they any other genres you were playing with? Um, well, I mean, I was in a band with Wiley, believe it or not, before Sacred Reich. Oh. We jammed, and yeah, you know, we were in just you know, bands. Yeah. But it didn't really get serious until I got in sacred Reich and we started doing our thing. And, um, you know, again, it's all just part of that 10,000 hours that you need to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to hone your craft, you know? And so you, you play every rat song and every, <laughs> yeah. just everything, you know, we played it, we played whatever. Played now, it all. Now, and, now, you mentioned you've talked about playing grass drums. What what was your similar choices in the early days? Or are you still playing? You know, oh, you um, play you minor, know, I, right? I was always a Zildjian guy, and I just when Minel started to come on the scene, I, I it kind of they kind of got my attention because just not only are they beautiful symbols, mm -hmm. you know, I mean they're just like pieces of art. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> but 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 they have such a unique range of you can you know you can of course get the standard stuff but they have just so many uh, special special you know symbols and like half half of half lathed and half natural and, and of course zildjian does the same thing but um and that was another similar story with like Gretsch, you know and i just i kept i had a i have a buddy that works he knows he works at the minor factory or something in germany and he's like let me see what i can do Mm -hmm. And of course, nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> nothing. But he put me in touch with the, the, the U S guy and he's like, just send this guy a message. And so every year I'd send him a message be like, Hey man, I really love your stuff. I'm not looking for a handout, you know, or anything you can do to help me I'm gearing up to go on tour. I want, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing. Finally, one year I just, I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to send him one more fucking email. And just see if, if I, and so I sent it and I wait and I wait and all of a sudden I get an email back and he's like, Greg, I received your email. And I'm like, yes. And he's like, <laughs> you know, however, and I'm like, no. Uh, <laughs> and then he's like, you know, uh, we're really not doing much at this time. And he goes, but, and I'm like, yes, looking up again. <laughs> he goes, send 
since uh, you know you've been so patient and so kind and and, and keep expressing interest. He goes, I'm going to give you a you know non official uh, a deal where. So basically, what I really wanted was just a direct line to the manufacturer, mm -hmm. to the artist relations guy, and they give me a very nice discount, and I get. Whenever I buy a symbol, I have a lifetime guarantee. So if I crack or break one of them, all I have to do is send it back. I mean, it's a beautiful deal. And, you know, again, like I said, I don't mind paying. Uh, it's not, I'm not, you know, it's funny because when you need the endorsements, you never get them. And then you become big and then everyone wants to give you free shit. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, how come you couldn't have done that when I was struggling? You know, yeah, that's, but, weird how, that's weird how that works. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, again, I was just pleased with that relationship and, and, um, you know, it, uh, you know, it could have been Zildjian if it, just as, as easily, but, you know, I think I just got in uh, with Meinl at the right time. And I mean, they're, they're huge of course now, but you yeah. know, I've had this going on for years. So, um, now, another question I had about your setup, you've always had a, a really big setup in your early days, um, and I think that was really influential to other thrash bands around you guys. Was that a, did you kind of get tired of, like, lugging that around night to night, or was that, was that, <laughs> did you slim down, you know, over time with that? Well, no, when I, when I had only slimmed down when I had to move it myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I always had a tech, usually, you know, or in the early days, it was a friend of mine. Of course, I always participate in my own setup. Mm -hmm. I'm not that guy that just div just divorces myself for the whole thing. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what, fuck it. You better get it right or whatever. You know, I mean, uh -huh. of course it, it behooves you to be there and, and kind of, you know, oversee things. And of course, if you can't be there, you need a tech that very accurate. And of course mine were, but uh -huh. I like to be part of that whole thing. So, you know, what else have I got to do? Go sit in a green room somewhere. So yeah, it's part of a machine. But, um, <laughs> no, and, and you know, it's, it's honestly, it was even really something that we thought about. It was just more, it was just cute. You know, we all had a bunch of crap. It was just, mm, yeah. <laughs> it's just I'll shove it in the truck and make it, you know, work. But, uh, a lot of the time, like early days when we took atrophy on tour and like we shared my kit. So oh, nice. we had help, we had the help of both bands and, you know, we just made do, but when I, I was out of sacred right for a small time, you know, you pare down your stuff because I don't, I don't own a truck, so I can't really get everything in my vehicle that I have. So, mm. um, but I prefer, I like the big kit. It's just fun. Yeah. So when you, when you guys were playing heavily through the, the touring and stuff, was there a practice president you had or, you know, your bass drum chops is extraordinary by the way, or was just kind of the day to day that kind of kept them up for you? You know, as a band, Sacred Reich really, well, I don't know about now, I can't speak for them now, of course, I'm not there, but mm -hmm. we never, we didn't really practice a lot. Like, if we were going to go on tour, we'd start practicing a couple weeks before, run through the set, and, um, I mean, in the early days, of course, we did, we practiced a lot, but as you, you know, progress and tour, I mean, touring, if you really think about it, it's just like every night, you're you're practicing at a high level, yeah, with, <laughs> you with, know, with nerves attached to you. Yeah. It was, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is not a drill. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is the real thing. And so, you know, you just, you, you start to get good at what you're doing and, um, you don't need as much practice. Of, of course, it's like I said, again, it's a stamina issue really for, for me and probably even for, you know, a singer, someone that, especially someone that plays bass and sings. Mm hmm. You know, it's a lot of work, and and so you definitely need to prepare yourself in that way for for what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can understand. That. If I don't play drums for a couple of days, I I feel like I'm down. You know, so I I totally get that. But uh, yeah, what were the the most memorable festivals or shows you kind of played throughout your career that you still kind of flash back on quite often? Oh God, well of course the Dynamo. Um, the Dynamo Open Air Festival in Holland. Oh, nice! The first time we played, we played there twice, two or three times, uh, twice. But that was the really the first. I can't know the first, but um, it 
kind of, you know, I used to get really nervous and <laughs> I'd throw up and shit before <laughs> I'd play. And, and not, not only from the nerves, but just from the, the, like, we played Death Squad and then, like, I don't even know. The first two songs were like Victim of Demise and Death Squad. Well, I think and it I, was just not to interrupt you, but I think a lot of people forget that just traveling in general wears you down before you even get to that point. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But then the first two songs were just like a, a sprint, you know, and I'm like throwing up while I'm playing. And <laughs> so that night we played at, at Dynamo. Uh-huh. I was like, you know what? Why am I keep my nerves are so fucked up? And I just said, I'm going to leave this out here. I'm just going to leave it backstage and I'm not taking it with me to the drums. And I'm just going to, and it was weird because I just walked out there and owned it and I didn't get sick. And, and it was, and and from that night on, I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. This is it. A lot of these people are here to watch me play anyway. So what am I nervous about? Yeah. Yeah. Do what I've been doing every other time. Just more people. Yeah. You can definitely be your own worst enemy when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've you, you can really get in your own head <laughs> about <laughs> shit, you know. Yeah, yeah. and you, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't really let yourself do that because, yeah, like someone, a friend of mine, we were talking about getting, you know, because a couple drummers, and I'll, I'll leave them nameless, but they were like hitting a wall. They're famous drummers, by the way, that everyone would know, and they were hitting a wall with their feet live and. You know, he's like, I'm like, what's the matter? And he's like, ah, I can't, I just, I can't do it. And I go, what do you mean you can't do it? You, know, you did it last night. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, yeah. And I go, so it's not, the, it's not that you, it's, it's you, it's your head. You're, you're getting in your own way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I said, if you right now start focusing on your breathing, you'll fucking start freaking out. <laughs> you'll be like, am I breathing right? Or, oh, oh shit. Did I inhale, exhale? Oh God, my timing's all off. I'm like, yeah. You know, it's something you don't really think about is breathing and like the rhythm of playing drums. Of course you have to think, Yeah, but you're more, you know, you have to not overthink things and like, yeah, you can't get in your own head. Yeah. And then once I had a talk with them, they were just, they, I fucking fixed them. Like I was like that dog whisperer guy on tv <laughs> uh, i'm like no more barking you uh, will not bark anymore sometimes it just takes that reality check to kind of bring you back into you know the main world a little bit i'm like dude i've heard you do it 50 times you do it on records you do it all the time what the fuck man <laughs> it's like a horse running up to a cliff and then stopping yeah yeah and i'm like you know you you're just you're getting there and you're just you're talking yourself out of it at the last second and then you take the easy way out and you're not happy about it. And I can tell you're not, you're pissed off about it, but just fucking do it. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, well, not, not, do to, it. not to mention who that was, but uh, on that topic, what were some of the, the, the funner bands to travel with and tour with in your opinion? Well, I mean, we always had fun with whoever we were with, uh-huh. you know, um, obituary. We took them. I uh, was on their first ever tour too. And, those guys are a blast and they're just like family and you know, there's uh one big rolling party with those guys, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, I can see that. And they're cool. So, but uh, really everyone, I mean, we never had any, any problems with any bands we were touring with or, mm-hmm. you know, no fist fights or we're, we're pretty easy. To lock. We were, you know, pretty easy to get along with and, so with that being like said, said, it's just rock and roll, man. No, no sense in getting all uppity. Well, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to bring up your entrepreneur initiative. If I even said a word, you actually just started a company called Rock the Cookie. Can you tell us, yeah. little, can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, man. So it's like you said, it's called Rock the Cookie, and it just really kind of started itself. It was totally an accident. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I like to bake. And you can tell by my awesome physique that I like <laughs> cookies, but, uh, you know, so I would bake stuff. And of course, like everybody in the world, you post pictures of every single thing in your life. And so I post pictures of my cookies and all of a sudden people are from Ireland and from all over the world. Like, Hey, how do I get those? Go, oh, man, those look good. Oh, Hey. And I'm like, just go make some fucking cookies, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then I start realizing that like baking really is kind of a lost art unless you do it a lot. It's like anything It's like crumbing or anything else. If you, you know, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh And, and the less you do, you know, a lot of people's uh, experience with baking is going to the frozen section and buying some 
frozen dough balls and baking them. Yeah, yeah. And so I said, okay. So one guy, he goes, I want to buy those cookies. And I'm like, fine, come on over. I'll sell them to you. And sure enough, he pulled up in front of my house and bought my cookies. Right. This is before I even had a name or anything. Uh-huh. And so Wiley owns a restaurant here with two other people. Mm-hmm. It's called uh, Rehab Burger Therapy. I've heard of that one. And uh, it's a fantastic burger joint, by the way. But so the chef there, his name's Ken, uh, he saw my cookies and he's like, okay, I'm looking at these cookies now. You need to bring me some of those because I know, I know the person that makes the best cookies. <laughs> and so I don't know. I want to. And I'm like, okay, no pressure. You know, a, a fucking culinary institute trained chef is asking me for my cookies. Okay. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I make them some and I take them to them and I drop them off and I leave. And I, I now no sooner turn the corner than I get a phone call and mouth full. He's like, these fucking cookies are so good. Holy shit. Oh, and nice. So, nice. so I'm like, oh, he goes, you got to do something with this. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And he's like, just start selling cookies. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And, I, and even at that, I just dismissed it. I'm like, and I go, what do I call it? You know, mm-hmm. Greg's great goodies or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like, no, he goes, rock the cookie. Well, that's and I'm like, pretty bad. I go, yeah. And at first I was like, I don't know. But then I thought, well, what if the mascot was a cookie and his name is rock? Yeah, that's pretty cool. So that's it. So uh, rock is the cookie. So then I come up with this whole backstory. Once he said that, I'm like, okay. So <laughs> the story is these guys rock. Now I have Chip. Chip's the drummer. He's a skateboarding chocolate chip. Oh, nice. And now and now I have Milk. He's the guitar player. Oh, cool. But they're all on their way to Cookie Palooza because they're like <laughs> the biggest cookie band in the world, and they're going to play a concert. Mm-hmm. And so they're it's like uh, it's like the Blues Brothers where they're getting picking up the band members as they go. Mm-hmm. And so they're just kind of traveling, getting all their band together, and they're going to go play this cookie concert. And <laughs> everyone's like, that is the fucking funniest shit I've ever heard. Yeah, you should make so, a, yeah, the, a, comic, yeah. a comic out of it as well, too. Well, and so I mean, the funny thing is, my buddy that um, he designs all the my little characters, you can go check them out at rockthecookie.com, but um, he's really talented, but he wants to animate it. And, Hold on, bear with me. Oh, no worries. And uh, he's like, dude, we should animate these. And so I have a really good friend. Uh, his name's Craig Gass. He's a comedian. Mm-hmm. He's been on Family Guy and American Dad and all this stuff. He does voiceover work. And so I go, hey, man, will you be the voice of my cookie? And he's like, fuck yeah, I'll do that. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so I'm like, we're going to actually try to animate this thing and make it make them talk well, and make a, them move, a but, weird uh, situation has turned into a whole manifest of, like, yeah it really is fucking really fun and we're just having a blast with it now do you and, guys uh, uh, take orders or do you deliver I, I yeah can't... yeah we take orders we can't ship out of the state yet of arizona but uh-huh. um we deliver inside the metro phoenix area and um you know you can just order off the website um but um <sighs> What was I going to say? Is there any uh, social media pages we can follow or like? Yeah, Facebook and Instagram. Okay, just simply under Rock the Cookie. Yep, and you can check it out. uh, Check it out there. But, like, we we make our own brown sugar. We make our own vanilla. Mm -hmm. All Like, all the chocolate products we use are all, like, imported Belgian chocolate. So we use all the best ingredients, and, you know, it it makes a really good uh, cookie. We make other things besides cookies, too. Like banana breads and other, you know, just different little items. But it's been fun, man. Like I said, like, you know, it's just totally an accident. Yeah. I I tripped and fell into a cookie business. (laughs) Not many people (laughs) could say that, but that's pretty cool, man. No, it's freaking really fucking funny. So I just now got my first t-shirt made. So those are available, too, at rockcookie.com. Awesome. And, uh, well, you know, I said, I'm going to keep... Keep going until you see some famous rock stars wearing my shirt. Oh yeah, I'll definitely and I got one uh, myself. <laughs> I got um, I got one that's going to wear it on tour coming up, so okay. you'll be on the lookout for for that. Well, uh, well, before I let you go, is there any up and coming uh, metal drummers you're keeping an eye on, or anyone that you kind of just reach back and still listen to and awe at all? I mean, you know, it's so weird to say, but I. I the only metal that I really listen to is if uh, Meshuga. 
yeah, yeah, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, and and um, and so I don't listen to a lot of like new metal is out, or mm-hmm. I, I I listen to mostly like jazz prog stuff, like Simon Phillips and um, like drummer, you know, drum Steve drummer Smith bass, and all that. Yeah. yeah, of course, Dave Weckl, Larnell yeah. Lewis. Yeah, he's got some badass uh, live lessons he does too. You got a chance to check uh, out. Who's that, Larno? <laughs> no, Weckl. He does his live lessons. Oh, yeah. Him. No, I, you know what? I have I signed up for like live alerts. So my phone will just go off and he's like doing a thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah. No, Weckl's fucking amazing. But yeah. So yeah, I listen to like all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, when you play a certain type of music, it's good to escape into something else. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And not just be, keep like, again, it's like all, how I've always been. Mm-hmm. I always would seek out the stuff that uh, I almost didn't understand. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a whole different language, you know. And then once you listen to it enough, you start uh, learning the language. Now, one quick story, and I miss him terribly, and um, Reed Mullen. Mm-hmm. He was a longtime friend of ours. And um, we were on a on a cruise, and he was at Soundcheck. And... Uh, I, the guy goes, okay, play the full kit. And I don't know where it came from. It was like speaking in tongues. Like all of a sudden this fucking weird jazz shit came out of me. <laughs> and like everyone stopped and turned around and looked. And I was like, just like fucking ripping this crazy shit. And, yeah, then, yeah. and he just, he looks and he goes, you've been studying jazz or something. And I'm like, no, I don't know where that came from, man. That was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, was like a, it was just in there, you know, it was like busting to get out, you know? <laughs> yeah, that happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I'm like, damn, dude, I got to keep listening to this stuff because it's working. I didn't even know it was, but it is. Yeah. Well, uh, Greg, it's been a real pleasure to have you. You're a very cool dude. And yeah, I wish he's the best of your business for your business. I mean, and yeah, so check him out at rockthecookie.com. He delivers in the metro area. And yeah, check out his yeah, catalog. Man. catalog. The show will be on YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple. Uh, thanks a cool. lot, Greg. One more time. Thank you. You bet, brother. Thank you. Yep.